Okay, so it's time to resume. Bring this computer out of sleep. So let's see if the password works. It does. And we're carrying on now with the beginning of chapter eight. So there are all the packages that are going to be installed and each one of these packages forms the final Linux from scratch system. So all the packages we've installed up to now are purely there to build all of these packages. All the packages we've got at the moment aren't going to be in, in the final system. So introduction, it mentions about what's going to be done here, building it. Um, mentions optimizations here, they do not recommend using it. Um, I'm still, I have built with optimizations, uh, used to use them quite a lot in the past, but found that I used to get problems, random problems. Um, so I wouldn't really recommend them. I think the last LFS video I did was with optimization, optimizations and it seemed to go okay, I didn't seem to get any problems, although. Um, I did build Beyond Linux from scratch using that Linux from scratch and that, that didn't go too smoothly. So, um, yeah, probably not a good idea to do it, especially if it's the first time you built Linux from scratch. If you're seasoned and you're prepared to dig around to get to the bottom of problems, um, then maybe um, it's worthwhile. Certainly with the optimizations, you, you, you do get a speed increase. I've seen that for myself with Gen 2, with the optimizations, compiling them into Gen 2. Uh, certain programs do run, do, do run uh, substantially faster. But in terms of Linux Scratch as an educational process, no, nah, it's probably not worth it. There's a bit about libraries there. And then on to chapter about package management. Um, I tend to skip over this. I've never used package management uh, again because Linux from scratch is basically a, a primarily an education tool. I did used to run Linux from scratch as my day-to-day um, -day, uh, operating system of choice for a couple of years. And what I tended to do was either update the odd package um, such as LibreOffice or Firefox or whatnot uh, individually, but tended not to do libraries or um, lower level packages. Uh, what I tend to do is to update it every six months from scratch, which obviously was quite a lot of work. And it wasn't until I discovered Gen 2 that I switched to Gen 2 as my main um, operating system. Still got the benefits of a source based and obviously optimized operating system. Um, but with the ease of being able to select features to turn on and off and and of course the optimization was still there. So yeah, I'd normally, like I say, just was over this. I've, I've never got involved in package management at all. So we start off now with man pages is the first package. Um, so let's extract man pages. And this is a simple command just to install obviously some pre made files and that's it. Nice and simple. Move on to Iana ATC. Probably the simplest and smallest package out of all of them. There's a basically just a couple of files that get installed. Uh, they get copied to ATC.
And now we move on to GDBC. So obviously this is part of the core system, part of the tool chain. So it's important we get this one right. Okay, so because we've got a different, probably a different bash actually, um, I'm, we're not getting the effect that I had before where it automatically picked out the archive. It's doing the normal behavior that I usually see. So whether that's a feature flag of bash perhaps or some other option, I don't know. Um, but you see what's happened here. It's incomplete the file name and when I press tab a couple of times it shows that it doesn't know whether I want the patch file or the tar file. Well I want the tar file. The discriminating character to get the tar file is the full stop, the period. So I'll take that and you can see it auto completes. So change into the directory and we can now start with the instructions in the manual. So the first one is to apply that patch. Now we can create a temporary build directory. Change into it. And the first thing we've got to do is to make a change and then run the configure command. Just have a quick look to see how long this is going to take. So this is 24 static bash units. So in theory, this is going to take nearly 50 minutes to compile. Um, I can't remember if that includes the tests or not, but uh, we'll see. So we've done the configure. There's the new options explained there. And now I'm going to start the build.
Okay, so that only took six and a half minutes. So it looks like the um, SBUs do include the testing. So let's run that now. It looks like there's a few tests that are expected. Let's time this. So this is the bit that could take um, a good half hour or more. Um, and as it says there, tests are considered critical when Julie is part of the tool chain. So it's best not to um, skip this and give time to let the tests run.
So that's taken just over half an hour to finish and we have some failures. So we just need to find out what they are. We've got two failures, two ex unexpected failures and two unexpected or expected failures or in two unexpected passes. So let's have a look. So we've got one fail there, misc test TTY name. So it's known to fail in the true environment. So that's fine. And IO test Elch mod. So that's the other one that's known to fail in the true. And then we've got the um, unexpected passes which are not a problem so that looks like a successful build and um, test I just notice this slightly off the edge I didn't notice that before so I think we can go ahead and install the package and we'll just touch one file to prevent a warning. And we can change the make file. Now we install the package. Oops. Okay, so now we can run this setting. And copy a file and make a directory. Now we need to install some locales. Um, normally you don't install the locales that are appropriate to you. But what the text is saying there is to install all these to ensure that the tests for the coming packages have got the best coverage. So some of the tests use some of these locales. So what I would normally do being in Great Britain is to just install these two locales because that's all I would need. But because I want to run tests on the up and coming packages. I want to copy all of these and install them with one go and I believe they don't produce any output so as long as I get a prompt pack at the end of this and they can take some time some of these especially I think some of the Chinese ones. Um, you've got China, Hong Kong and Taiwan there. Um, and as long as it comes back with nothing that would have been successful. Um, it does say that you can install every single locale with this command here which obviously takes a lot longer so I'm not going to do that um, and then it also says to add any additional locales that are not in the locale data supported file which I think is what this uh, command goes on so once yeah we've just got the prompt back so that's completed all the locale definitions that are needed for tests as well as uh, incidentally for me the two locales that I would have installed are in that list anyway as I've said if there are any others then you can just adapt these to what you need if your locale is not there um, 
So something about internationalised domain names if that's needed to go to the BLFS page to install that library uh, but not needed in a normal Linux from scratch installation so now we install this file here add some time zone data so we just put these commands in Just going to add these one at a time to make sure there's no problems. Let's just check that because I had a carriage return there. Yeah, so that's okay. That's worked fine. Then we run this for command in which runs each of these ZIC commands. Oh, that looks okay, it's just warnings. So now we copy a file and run this command here. Now you don't need to change the America, New York, that's just the default zone, which I think it mentions in the text somewhere. So that's that. Now we need to select our own time zone, we can use this utility to do that just enter what continent you're on so for me it's Europe uh, look for your country so Britain and it says uh, that Europe London will use and it's just verifying that the time is correct um, UTC time so you can see the clock currently set to UTC because it's actually 10 to 4 here in the UK because um, we're in British summer time so yes that's fine and then it just confirms that Europe London is the time zone that I need to use and this command we now need to put in and where it's got the replacement characters here is where I copy and paste the output from that script so just paste Europe stroke London there Obviously that would be different if you are in a different country. As an example, it's got in there Canada stroke Eastern as the time zone. So now we need to create a couple of scripts for the or configuration files for the dynamic loader. Um, it says to um, dynamic loader can also search the directory and include the contents of files found there so it's a good idea to add this into the file as well as an extra place for it to search for files so put both of those in and that's glibc done so we'll tidy that up and move on to zlib So extract it, go into it, and we just run some simple commands to get this configured, built, tested, yep that's fine, that doesn't take long at all, and installed. And then finally, remove a static library. And that said, we've done. So now we move on to BZIP2. Okay, so again, we've got yeah, a patch. So we need to put a full stop in to get the correct, correct name for the tar file and we can now run that patch in a couple of said changes and then we prepare 
it's the bzip2 source package compiling with these two commands and then one command makes and tests the package now we can install bzip2 install a shared library and again remove a static library that's complete so let's tidy up and move on to XZ so first of all we've got a configure build XZ run some tests all oh, nine tests passed, that's good install it and that's XZ done Now we move on to Z standard. Again, looks like we've got a patch we have, so just put a full stop and tab, change into the directory, run the patch in. That's okay, and then compile the package. There's no configuration of the package Okay, so now we're going to run some tests. It does say if you see the word failed in lowercase, it's not actually a failure. But just the word fail in capitals is a failure. So let's see how this goes. Okay, so that looks like it's passed, there's no errors or anything. Just sit back a little bit. There's 
nothing saying pass or fail so I assume that's worked so now let's install the package and again remove a static library and tidy up and now we can move on to file so configure Build it. Run some tests. Looks okay. Again, there's no summary or anything. We'll scroll back a little bit. There's nothing specific to speak of. So we'll just install it. And that's done. And now I'll move on to read line. So it says reinstalling read line will cause the old library to remove to library name old. And it says that running these two sets would avoid an issue there. So let's do that in case it does get reinstalled at some point. Prepare it for compilation. Now I can actually build a package, compile it. And run the command to install it and if we wish there's some documentation to install and that's that package done so m4 next That's all we can figure. And now we can build it. Run tests. And that looks like that's OK, there's no failures. So now we'll just install it. And that's done. Now we move on to BC. So I'll run this command here to compile, there's no configure. No, sorry, this is the configure, beg your pardon. It just looks slightly different. And now we build it with make. Run some tests. So 
So we've got all DC test pass and all BC test pass. So that's good. We can install it. And that's done. Move on to flex and we'll extract that. Start with configuring the package, ready for compilation. Compile the package. And run some tests. So those tests all passed. Let's now install the package. And it says a few programs don't know about Flex, so we'll create a link to Lex. And that's that package installed. So TCL. So there's a couple of packages here. So it looks like the documentation is the one that's got HTML in the file name. So we want this source one. So let's put an S in, extract that, change to the directory. And then the first command we do is to actually extract the documentation. Now we can prepare the package for compiling. That's done. Let's build it now. Okay, that's done. So we've got three set commands to put in. So these should each produce no output if they run successfully. So yep, that's okay. And then we just remove this environment variable that's been set. 
Now I can run the tests. Right, well that's finished uh, before I install it, let's look at the 
results. We've got no failure, so that's good. A few have been skipped, but that's generally not a problem. So let's now install TCL. So we've got a schmod to do. Install some headers for expect. Make a symbolic link. Remove a man page. Rename it rather. And install the documentation. And that's it. Tidy up and we'll move on to expect. So configure to begin preparation to compilation. Make will build it. Let's test the results. So we've got zero failures there. No skips or pass. Let's install it. It's done and one link. Let's expect done. And move on to Deja GNU. So a recommendation to build in a separate directory. So we create this separate temporary build directory. Change into it. Prepare the compilation. build the package and that was really quick install the package and some documentation and now that it's installed now this is the time we can check it which is a bit like the wrong way around but it's obviously the way it works so a number of expected passes, 300. That's on the run test, there was no errors. So everything looks good. Yep, that's fine. So we'll go back up to the sources, tidy up. And move on to bin utils. So you can see now, bin utils, the time has increased from one SPU to eight times that. And that's because, well, A, as I said before, the there's more being built in the package. And B, we've got tests to run. So that's why it's uh, exploded the time uh, from the original installation. So let's start by extracting it. And the first thing we need to do is to run this test using expect to ensure that PTYs are running. And we've got the correct response. If not, then need to be something done about that. It's generally something in the kernel. I, I thought I read somewhere years ago that these PTYs were going, but clearly they're not. Maybe maybe they changed the way they're implemented or something. Um, 
but yes, it, I, I think it's in the kernel somewhere that needs to be sorted out. But generally, if you've booted from a, uh, a distribution, uh, there's generally not a problem. I don't think I've ever seen this um, not not appear uh, that I can remember. So let's create again a temporary build directory. Prepare the package for compiling. And I'm going to time the make. I'd expect this to take more than the couple of minutes or so that it took originally because I think there's a gold linker that's going to be built which does take a little bit of time. I think it takes more time than the uh, traditional linker if I'm correct. Uh, yeah, this, this, this wasn't supplied before, this enable gold. So I think that's what's going to take up the majority of the build time. And then as I say, there's the checks to run as well.
Right, so that has taken seven minutes, which is nearly four times as long as it took to build the whole WinUtils package uh, in pass one, and that's just compiling the package. So it shows that, as I said, there's a lot more that gets compiled in, in the later passes. So now it's time to run the tests. Uh, again, it says it's critical because BinUtils is part of the tool chain. So let's time this and wait for the results.
Okay, so those checks have finished. Um, now, it does say there's errors. I, I always seem to get the old error with bin utils, and there's no never any mention in the book of why that might be. Um, and considering that these tools or these um, packages in Chapter 8 are being compiled with tools that we've already built apparently successfully um, it's a bit strange I don't really know why that is so um, there's nothing there with the LD I'm not sure if we can scroll back far enough gold was alright uh, just some for gold 0.1 that looked alright How far back we can go before we run out of scroll buffer? Um, yeah, that's as far as we can go. So it apparently it looks okay according to the outputs, but um, it does say that's errors. Let's try and run it again, I guess. Uh, probably it might take another five minutes to run. Um, I'll leave it. As I say, I can't. Oh, is this it here, maybe? Untested test cases. Uh, it could be this one, maybe. And that's the one that it's not tested. LD new, and that may be why it's failed then, perhaps. Um, and, and, yeah, it's not in this list here. So maybe for some reason it skipped it. Again, it could be the fact that we're in a true environment. So, uh, so I've never really got to the bottom of this, why this happens every time, and yet it's not mentioned um, in the book. Uh, maybe it's the fact that I use Gen 2. Maybe the LFS team use either LFS or some other distribution. So, um, yeah, I'll just accept that because as I've seen it before and it's, as far as I'm aware, never caused any problems as such. So just go for an install now. Be interesting to hear from anybody if uh, you don't get that error, if you're using a different host system in case that is the problem. So we've installed the system and removed some static libraries. So now let's tidy up. And move on to GMP. So it says if you're building for 32-bit x86, we have a CPU which is capable of running 64-bit code. And you have specified C flag, so A, we're not building on 32-bit x86, and B, we haven't specified C flag, so we can ignore that. Default settings for GMP produce libraries optimized for the host processor. So if the library is suitable for processors less, less capable than the host CPU desired, generic libraries can be created by running the following. Well, um, this Linux from scratch is not going any further than this machine. So I don't need to worry about that. But if you're intending to build Linux from scratch uh, to put on other machines with processors less capable, then that may be something you want to do. Other than that, let's run configure. Okay, so there's some prints out there. So you can see it's identified the uh, CPU as a Westmere architecture, 64-bit uh, ABI um, compiler and so on. So that looks okay. Let's build it.
it's done. Build some documentation. And now we can run the tests. Okay, and let's check the results. That so we've got one nine seven. It says one nine seven number of tests that should pass, so that's fine. Let's install the package. And the documentation. And that's done. So now we've got MPFR. So let's prepare the package for compiling. And again, we're going to build it first and then make some documentation. Build the documentation and when that's done we can run some tests. Okay, that looks like that's passed. Yeah, 181 passed, two tests were skipped. So install the package and install the documentation we created and that's done. So move on to MPC now. So I configure the package. Build it. Build the documentation and now I can run some tests. That's fine, 69 pass, no errors. So we'll install it and install the documentation and it's MPC complete. So 
And now we move on to ATTR. And we first configure the package to build. And now we compile it. So it says that it needs to be run on a file system that supports extended attributes such as x2, 3 or 4. Um, there's possibly other file systems that will support extended attributes. And there's two tests, two passes, so that's fine. Let's install package and now tidy up. So next we've got ACL. So let's run configure. And run make. Now it says the tests uh, need to be run on a file system that supports access controls after core utils have been built with the ACL libraries. So if you decide to return to this package and run make check after core utils have been built later in this chapter. Now what I normally do is just install this package, which I'll do now before I forget. Tidy it up and then after core utils has been built, I come back, rebuild it. Re, uh, and then test it. What I'm going to do this time is try something different and I'm going to leave this tab open. I'm going to leave the directory there and after core utils has been installed I'm just going to come back and run make check on the uh, source of the um, code, that, the object code that I've just created with compiling and see if that works without having to rebuild the whole package. If that works, then I know what's been installed is okay and it doesn't need to be reinstalled and overwritten. So I'll try that out, see how that pans out. Let's now move on to libcap then. So I'll just go back up to the sources and go on to libcap. So I said to prevent static libraries being installed. And there's no configuration for the package. We'll just go straight in to build it. And then test the results. So that looks fine. There's no errors. It says passed in a few places. So in fact, there's no errors is a good thing. Let's install it. And that's done. And we'll move on to Shadow. So it says if you want to enforce the use of strong passwords, you can jump into the BLFS book and install Cracklib. Uh, for now, with Linux from scratch, I just install it as it is because I want to keep it as uh, pure, if you like, as possible, uh, as, as close to possible as the default options for uh, Linux from scratch. But if you want to do that, add it now. You're quite welcome. Normally, if I'm going to build LF a BLFS, I'll go and reinstall Shadow after I've installed Crackrib when I'm following through the BLFS book. So to disable the installation of the groups program and its main pages as core utils provides a better version also prevent the installation of manual pages are all installed in main pages. So we've got this said to do here and three find commands which run said based on what the find command identifies or finds.
instead of using the default crypt method, use a more secure SHA-512 method of password encryption, which also allows passwords longer than eight characters. It's also necessary to change the obsolete VAR spool mail location for user mailboxes that shadow used by default to the VAR mail location used currently and get rid of bin sbin from passing so I'll simply sim links to their counterpart and user. If bin and sbin prefer to be left over and pass for some reason, modify the pass and bash RC after LFS is built. So that's one complete command here to do all that lot. And if you chose to build shadow with crack click, which you haven't, but if you did, you'd need to run that command in. And now we prepare it for compilation, touch a file and run in the configure command to prepare the compilation. And there's a status there of what libraries have been found and so on. Let's build the package. Now we'll install it and install some man pages as well by the looks of it. So configure it. We need to run these two commands to convert the passwords to shadow passwords and group passwords as well. Shadow's default configuration for the user and utility has a few caveats and needs some explanation. First, the default action for the user and utility is to create the user ID and group of the same name as the user by default user ID and the group ID numbers will begin with a thousand. This means if you don't pass parameters to user ID, each user will be a member of a unique group system. If this behavior is undesirable, you need to pass one of the minus G or minus N parameters to user ID or to change the settings of user groups enable in log login defs. Second, so normally you'd probably want to leave the default where there's a, a user ID and a group ID that matches, it's a bit more secure. Second, to change the default parameters, the file etc default user ID needs to be created and tailored to your particular needs. Create it with this. And there's an explanation underneath as to what these commands do. And there's another one here. This parameter, create mail spool equals yes, causes the user ad to create a mailbox file for the newly created user. User ad will make the group ownership of this file to the mail group with 0660 permissions. If you prefer that these mailbox files are not created by user ad, then issue the following command. So I think normally you don't have this, but if you wish to have that, then don't run the command. Now we set a password for root. So this is the root for the new LFS system. It hasn't got a password at the moment, or if it has, it's unknown. So I'm going to type in a password, whatever you choose, don't forget it because you won't be able to log in the first time and you'll have to mount the root system to run password again to change it. So apart from that, that's shadow done. So let's tidy that up.